Thank you, Debbie and Tim, for your back behind the scenes work today. Um, just appreciate y'all. Thank you for rolling with the punches like we seem to have done a lot in this last year and a half, right? But that's the world we live in. Got to do what we got to do. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 12 as we continue our journey through the book of John. It's a pediatrician named David Sakara tells the story of a little girl in his wife's Sunday school class. You see, his wife had prepared a lesson and, on being useful and, and told the children that everyone can be useful serving God. A brief moment of silence, and a little girl named Sarah spoke up. Says, "Teacher, what can I do? Because I don't know how to do many useful things." Well, Miss Sakara hadn't really anticipated that kind of response, but she quickly looked around and spotted an empty flower vase on the windowsill. Sarah, she said, "You can bring a flower and put it in that vase. It would be a very useful thing." Sarah frowned, but that's not really important. It is, her teacher said, if it's helping someone. Sure enough, the next Sunday, Sarah brought in her dandelion and placed it in that empty flower vase. Week after week, month after month, without ever having to be reminded, Sarah continued every single Sunday to bring a flower and put in that vase. Pastor heard about it, and he decided to move that vase into the sanctuary right beside the pulpit. And he preached a, a, a service, preached a sermon on that flower vase and being useful and doing God's work. And it just got to the point, everybody in the church looked forward to see what kind of flower Sarah would bring next week. Well, unfortunately, Sarah's family found out that Sarah had leukemia. And Dr. Sakara was her pediatrician. And he had to tell that family, there's just nothing that we can do medically. And as the days and weeks went by, Sarah got weaker and weaker, lost weight and got skinnier and was eventually bedridden. And now people were visiting her and bringing her a flower. One Sunday, when Sarah was very sick, at the end of the sermon, the pastor stopped mid-sentence looking at the back of the room. And everybody turned to see what he was looking at, and they all saw Sarah being rolled in on her wheelchair, wrapped in blankets, just wasted away to almost nothing. And to the silence of the entire sanctuary, Sarah went up and put a flower in that vase and then put a note beside that vase and went back and sat down. Four days later, Sarah died. And the day of the funeral, that pastor shared the contents of that note to Dr. Sakara. And Sarah had left a note, said, Dear God, this vase has been the biggest honor in my life. Thank you. Signed it, Sarah. I tell you, much of us for much of our life is, is spent finding out one very important question. What is my purpose? Why am I here? Now, Sarah, she found her purpose in, in bringing in a flower and placing it in that vase, and it just brightened everybody's world. It seems like an insignificant thing, doesn't it? But the reality is, anything we do for the Lord is not insignificant. Whatever God calls us to do is actually the most significant thing we can do. And whatever it is, we need to do it all to glorify God. See, purpose is important. Our purpose informs a lot of different things in life, right? Our, our purpose guides our decisions, the big decisions and the small decisions. Our, our, our purpose influences our behavior, what we choose to do and what we choose not to do. Our, our purpose offers us a sense of direction. It kind of serves there as a compass for all of us. And our purpose gives meaning to our life. Purpose is so very important. Now, for all of us, the details of that purpose in life is going to be different, right? The details between what God's called me to do, what God's called Ronnie to do, what God's called Melissa to do, what, what God's called Debbie and Tim to do, all of our details are going to be different. But the overarching purpose for all of our lives is to glorify God in everything that we do. That sounds so simple, doesn't it? But if we truly take that to heart and we truly glorify God in everything we do, won't it change so many things in our lives? How we go about it is different, but we all must 
glorify God. I, you know, I gotta be honest with you, sometimes when I read scripture, it can be kind of confusing, right? Sometimes there are debates over how are we gonna interpret this particular phrase or this particular verse or passage. But then there's sometimes that Jesus speaks very plainly and very clearly. This is one of those times where Jesus speaks plainly and clearly. And as we continue in our journey through the book of John, we need to remember that today's passage that we're going to be reading about doesn't really come after the triumphal entry. It's part of that same story. I mean, we're talking between verse 19, where we ended last week, and verse 20, where we're going to begin this week, was one breath. And then we continue on. So the cries of Hosanna are still echoing in, in Jerusalem. And this is what happens next, okay? We're going to read, starting in John chapter 12, verse 20. It says, Now some Greeks were among those who went to worship at the festival. So they came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, and requested of him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus replied to them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and it dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. The one who loves his life will lose it, and the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But this is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said it was an angel that had spoken to him. Jesus responded, this voice came not for me, but for you. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the rulers of this world will be cast out. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to signify what kind of death he was about to die. Then the crowd replied to him, we have heard from the scripture that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Jesus answered, the light will be with you only a little while longer. Walk while you have the light so that darkness doesn't overtake you. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Jesus said this and then went away and hid from them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you and we again just thank you. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. Father, I just pray you will help us to glorify your name in all that we do, including and especially as we read your word, your gift to us. Lord, I just pray that you will hide this man behind your cross and speak through these lips of clay. Not my words, Lord, but yours. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, in, in verses 20 through 21, John mentions some Greeks who went to see Jesus, all right? And it's important that, that, to point out, and John points out very specifically, that these were Greeks, and nothing in the Bible is there by accident. So we need to ask ourselves, why does John mention that these are Greeks? What do we know about these Greeks? Well, first of all, we know that they are worshipers of Yahweh. They are worshipers of God. It's because the Word of God says, now some Greeks who are among those who went to worship at the festival. These Greeks were there for the Passover. Well, I thought only Israelites celebrated the Passover, mostly Israelites, but it wasn't 100%. You know, the Old Testament has many Gentiles who have worshiped Yahweh and served God in some capacity. I mean, Jethro, father of Moses, he wasn't an Israelite, he was a Midianite. Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute, helped the spies to come into Jericho hid them for, you know, and, and God used her in a mighty way. Obed-Edom, the Gittite who housed the Ark of the Covenant for th three months following Uzzah's death when he had reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant when David was moving it. The sailors who threw Jonah overboard, right? They threw him overboard. Why? Because they feared God. Feared God is a Hebrew kind of a way of saying they worshiped God. 
All right, and we know this. So God has used Gentiles there, and these are just a few examples. There are all kinds of examples in the Old Testament of Gentiles who God has used and who worshiped the Lord. Now, some of them very honorably, and some of them just kind of tried to add God to all the other little G gods they worshiped, which is not how God would have us worship him. He is the only God. But the reality is Gentiles who worship Yahweh aren't extremely unusual, but they were treated as second-class citizens by the rest of the Israelites. Because the Israelites took the label, the people of God, to heart, which is a great thing. We should take any label God gives us to heart, but if we're not careful, we're going to take it a little too far, and it becomes all about the label, not all about the God who gave it. Everything we need to do needs to be about God and to glorify Him. Now, I find it interesting to me personally that the Greeks understood what was going on a lot better than the Israelites. The Israelites were saying, our king has come to release us from Roman rule. And what do the Greeks want? I think they say what's one of the best lines in all of the Bible and in something that resonates with my soul. I want to see Jesus. That's going to be one of the first things I say in heaven. I don't know about you. I just want to see Jesus. And, 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 you know, we're not talking about see Jesus as in a celebrity sighting, right? That's not the kind of see Jesus we're talking about. The Greek word used there for the word see really denotes I want to get to know him. I want to emulate him. I want to follow him. These Greeks were absolutely right, were the people of God, many of which were absolutely wrong. And also notice they went to Philip, right? They went to Philip. Why? Because Philip is a Greek name. So they probably felt more comfortable with Philip. Philip came from Bethesda, which is a, an area of Israel that had a lot of Gentiles that lived there. So the Greeks may even have been from Bethesda. We don't know that, but there were a lot of Greeks in Bethesda. So it does stand to reason they felt more comfortable around Philip. So what, what did Philip do? Well, he, first of all, Philip gave us another lesson in evangelism. The reality is we kind of have this impression sometimes that the disciples were these heroes of the faith, these giants of the faith that just always did everything right. <laughs> no. Now, by the end of their lives, were they heroes and giants of the faith? Absolutely. But at this point in time, they're still rather immature in their faith. But let's cut them some slack. Some of us are frequently as well, aren't we? Matter of fact, all of us are sometimes. And Philip had these people who wanted to see Jesus. And what does he do? Well, he goes to his buddy Andrew and said, hey, Andrew, these guys want to see Jesus, but Jesus is kind of busy right now, man. I don't know what to do. So Andrew and Philip together go to see Jesus and say, hey, there's some Greeks here that want to see you. What's the evangelism lesson in that? Well, here's the deal, folks. Sometimes sharing your faith can be scary. It can be intimidating. It can make you go, well, I just... I don't want them to think poorly of me. I, I don't want them to, to hear something from me that they don't want to hear, right? I don't want to damage my friendship with them, so I'm just going to let this opportunity pass. Just let them go on and die and go to hell. No problem, right? Well, the reality is, if you're scared to share the gospel, especially if you haven't done it many times before, go get you a believer friend and say, hey, will you go with me? Because I, I, I feel like I'm supposed to share the gospel here, but I'm, I'm a little nervous. And if you're that believing friend, go pray. Don't go and step in, but go and support them as they share the gospel. I think this is a wonderful evangelism lesson for all of us. Because sometimes it is scary to share your faith. Now, I'm not saying call on somebody else to do it. I'm saying bring somebody else with you to support you and help you. Okay? And, and, and you know... Philip, again, he's not always the most decisive, but he really did the, wrong, the right thing here. And don't let your fear of a situation keep you from being obedient to God. Okay? And Jesus, he reacts kind of in an odd way when he hears there's these Greeks that want to meet them. We honestly never know if the Greeks get to see Jesus or not. Because what's Jesus' first response? He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Wait a minute, hadn't Jesus already kind of been glorified in the last three years of his ministry? I mean, you know, for goodness sake, God spoke audibly on two occasions at Jesus' baptism and then also again at the transfiguration. 
God has already spoken audibly to Jesus and other people heard it. So surely he has been glorified by this. Surely these, these miracles that he has performed and these wonderful teachings that he has done have, have glorified them, right? Yes, they did, but the hour has come. Remember, hour, we've talked about this before. The Greek concept of time has two different kind of versions, if you will. You have chronos, which is the time of day. Chronos tells us it is currently 25 minutes after 11. But kairos tells us it's the right time to do something. And what Jesus here was having a kairos moment. It is time for me to come and do what I'm here to do. This really kind of ushers in the beginning of the passion. In the, book, in the Gospel of John, chapter 12 is Jesus' last public teachings before the crucifixion. The rest of the book of John between chapters 13 up until he is crucified is Jesus teaching the disciples. Kind of a, a more private lessons, if you will for lessons the disciples were ready for, but the general people may not have been. So it, it, it's, this is really signifies a, a sharp turn towards the cross. The time has come. Verses 24 through 26 open with Jesus, again, waving that flag, waving that flag that says, hey, what's coming next is important. In the Holman, it's translated, I assure you. In the King James, verily I say to you. In the Greek, it's amen, amen. In other words, here it comes, listen carefully, okay? And what Jesus says and what Jesus tells us to listen carefully for just goes to reinforce the fact that God's economy is greatly different than ours. What God sees as important and what the world sees as important are vastly different many, many times times. And Jesus has this statement. He says, I assure you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and it dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces a large crop. Okay, Nash, how is that some kind of a spiritual aha moment? He's talking about planting the garden, right? Well, he's probably talking about more in the garden because he was talking to farmers, right? But he's talking about planting things, planting wheat. Let me ask you a question. This is kind of a a, a weird question, but I want you to think about this one for a minute, okay? Would you call a seed alive or dead? Kind of depends, doesn't it? I mean, if I were to sit a seed right up here on this pulpit right here and leave it for about a month, what's it going to do? Rot. <laughs> Nothing positive, right? It's dead as a doornail. But if you take that same seed and you place it in good soil at the proper time and you give it fertilizer, you, you feed it, you make sure it has water, you make sure it has everything that it needs and you try to keep away the things it doesn't need, what's that seed going to do? It's going to grow and turn into life. Much like Jesus himself, like a, a single seed that's been sown apparently dead then springs up alive after being put into the ground. So Jesus will be sown into the ground, and through his death and resurrection, there will come much fruit. So what Jesus is saying here and what he's telling the disciples and, and in his word, what he's telling us is that Jesus' role is to bring fruit and to glorify God the Father. And by going to the cross and by dying is how that is going to take place. In verse 25, Jesus says, The one who loves his life will lose it. The one who hates his life in the world will keep it for eternal life. That's kind of a weird thing to say, too. Isn't that backwards? Jesus is telling us that if we're to die to ourselves, then we can produce much fruit in him. But if we continue only to live for ourselves, we will not produce fruit for him. So what's that telling us? See, Jesus' life and death, Jesus on the cross of Christ, is, is how we get our salvation. That is what saves us. But it also serves as an example for each and every one of us. Right? We can't love our life. There's an inevitable conflict there. There are things about this life I love. I've got to be honest with you. There are things about in life that I really enjoy and that I really love. I enjoy being able to proclaim the word of God to people, even if it is just to three people in a camera. 
But the reality of it is, there's some things in this life that aren't so great, right? It's easy for us to say, okay, I'm going to die to sickness. I don't want that, so I don't mind putting that aside. But the fun stuff, if we love it more than we love Jesus, then we're never going to produce much fruit. Okay, Jesus isn't telling us we need to hate our life. He's not talking about, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, self-harm type words here. What he's saying is it's all about what you cherish the most. And if you cherish anything more than you cherish Jesus, more than you cherish God, then you're not in a place where you need to be. And so all of us can take that lesson. And again, sometimes it's easy Let's see, do I'm going to enjoy algebra homework or working for Jesus? That's an easy one, right? But sometimes it's a little tougher. I've got to be honest with you. I love Melissa with all my heart, but I've got to love God more. That's hard sometimes. That really is. But that's the way God has called us to live our lives. Our purpose in life is to cherish Jesus. And in doing so, we glorify God. But how in the world are we supposed to do that? How do we show that to the world? Well, verse 26 tells us, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Okay, in case you're asking yourself, how in the world am I supposed to do what God's called me to do? Here's the answer. Follow him. That's simple, isn't it? Think back to kindergarten. We played a game called follow the leader, right? That's great spiritual practice. And our leader is God and, and the Holy Spirit living within us to tell us where to go. We just have to follow the leader and follow God and follow the path that God has laid out for us. Sometimes that path is going to take us to some wonderful, great places, and sometimes the path is going to take us to some difficult, tough places. But if we're following Christ, following somebody means you're never alone, right? Obviously, if there's a leader and then there's you, that's at least two. And he is with us everywhere that we go. And all we need to do is follow him. You see, Jesus, you know, in the economy of God, there are these apparent contradictions, right? And a lot of non-believers will say there are contradictions all over the place in the Bible. Say, no, there really aren't. We just always, don't always understand God's economy. We don't always understand what he is asking of us. You know, for example, if you want to be honored, you must serve. That pretty much goes against what the world teaches, doesn't it? Death leads to life. What? Really? Yeah, die to self, meaning what Nash wants to do doesn't drive Nash anymore. Nash needs to do what God calls him to do. Period. Always. There's no, yeah, but. Mm -mm. Always. Self-preservation leads to destruction. Whew. Nobody wants to go through tough stuff. Nobody wants to feel pain. That's just kind of weird if you like pain. But the reality is sometimes God needs us to go through these tough areas to strengthen ourselves for the next journey. Maybe to be an example to somebody. But it always has a purpose, and that purpose glorifies God. This calling isn't easy. <laughs> and it wasn't easy for Jesus either. Verse 27, Jesus states the most human thing he could ever say, Now my soul is troubled. Jesus knows what's coming. The cross wasn't a surprise to him. Before he did that first miracle, turning water to wine in Cana, Jesus knew where this would lead. Right, but all of a sudden, he's starting to look it in the face. He's turned the corner, and there it is. He can see it, and his soul is troubled. So much of the gospel message is focused on the deity of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is 100% God. But Jesus is also 100% human. And sometimes we can lean too far one way or the other. And then we need to have a balanced approach where we see both of those, right? And this is such a human reaction. And it's to say, Jesus is saying, look, God, this is going to be hard. This is going to hurt. This is, this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. Not only is he having to go through some physical stuff coming up at the crucifixion, but he's also going to suffer separation from God because what can separate us from God? That's sin. And Jesus took upon himself our sin. 
And, and so for the first and only time in his whole existence, he felt a separation between him and his heavenly father. He, he was not looking forward to that at all, but he knew it was something he had to go through if he was to glorify God. Jesus says, should I just ask God to protect me? And by the way, if he had asked, you know, the angels would have done it. All he had to say is, at any point in this process, they ain't worth it, I'm out. Guess where we'd be? Hopelessly lost. But he loved us too much to do that. Jesus prays, Father, glorify your name. Yes, I'm scared. No, I really don't want to do this. Later in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays, if there's any other way we can do this, let's go with plan B. But not my will, but yours be done. And here he says, but Father, glorify your name. That's Jesus' purpose in life. That's his overarching purpose in everything that he does. And, and really, this is a great prayer for all of us to pray at any time. It is always appropriate, no matter what you're facing. Father, glorify your name. And in this simple little prayer, Jesus reveals that primary purpose in his life. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't, he doesn't speak in parables. He doesn't speak in riddles. He speaks very plainly here. Even though he's facing something brutal, beatings, humiliation of arrest, separation from God because of our sin and an excruciating death on the cross. And his prayer isn't, Lord, protect me. His prayer isn't, Lord, get me through this. His prayer is, Father, glorify your name. I got to tell you, we got to pray that same thing. And that's hard because when we get to a difficulty in life, what's our first reaction? I don't want to do that. It's a very human reaction, right? But the problem is if God has called you to do whatever that is, then that is exactly what you need to do. When the Israelites came to the Red Sea, did God get rid of the Red Sea? No, he provided a way through it. And he'll do the same thing for us in our problems. Doesn't mean it'll always be easy. Never said that. In this life, you will have trouble, but he will give us a way through. And God gives Jesus immediate reassurance that he has chosen the correct path because he audibly speaks from heaven. Wouldn't that have been awesome to hear? I tell you, that would have just been awesome. God speaks from heaven and says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. In other words, God said, that's the right answer. That's the right prayer. And when we pray the right prayer, God answers it yes every single time. And God's saying that's exactly what you need to be about, son. <laughs> but what do you think, what would you have done if you had heard the voice of God audibly? Honestly, we probably would have been a lot like the Israelites. They were confused. Now, granted, this is not something you experience every day. Just standing here off the top of my head, I can only think of three occasions where God audibly spoke from heaven. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but I know three in Jesus' life, we've already talked about them. This one, his baptism and the transfiguration. This is not something that happens every day. And so the Israelites, and maybe even the Greeks there too, kind of got in an argument about what, is, what did we just hear? Some said, ah, it's just thunder. I've heard thunder a lot in my life, and I've heard some loud thunder that was a little bit frightening. I've never heard thunder that sounded like words. That just doesn't make any sense. Others said, well, okay, I can see that this is obviously a divine act. Something of God is going on here. But it was just an angel. Just an angel. <laughs> angel speaks to me. I'm still going, yes, sir. Okay. But the reality is the crowd was confused. And Jesus himself gives interpretation for this voice from heaven when he says, not for me, this voice is not for me, but for you. Again, this is a very important time. Again, not Kronos, but Kairos. This is a very important time in the life of this crowd because they can, from this experience, have an obvious evidence of the deity of God, of the deity of Jesus. I'm sorry, that Jesus Christ is Messiah is the Son of God. And, and, and then Jesus goes on to continue to say, the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's the ruler of this world? Depends on who you ask, doesn't it? 
To many of those Israelites, they standing there, they heard exactly what they wanted to hear. Have you ever done that before? <laughs> yeah, we all done that before. They heard the ruler's going to be cast out. Rome's going down. Caesar's gone. Yay! That is not what Jesus said. That is not what Jesus meant. Who's the ruler of this world? Satan, and he has already been defeated on the cross of Christ. Jesus was successful in casting out the ruler of this world. His ultimate demise hasn't happened yet, but it will. I don't know when. You don't know when. Nobody, Jesus didn't know when. Only God the Father knows. But it will happen. How can I be so sure? Because it's in here. And we serve a God that keeps his promises. The ruler of this world has been cast out. Satan will continue to fight. He'll continue to try. He can't have us, but he can mess with us and try to affect our witness. But if you're a child of God, you are out of his reach to grab, but he will mess with you. And you need to be, you need to be on your guard. All of us do. And continually turn our eyes upon Jesus or the things of this world are going to distract us from our ultimate purpose in life. Jesus goes on to talk about being raised up. Not as in elevated or honored, but he's talking about what kind of death he would experience. John says this quite clearly. And again, we hear raised up and we think different things, but John seems to also indicate the crowd knew what he was talking about as well. And through Jesus' death, people will come to Christ. We understand that because we're on the other side of the cross. But how do you think this sounded to the disciples? How did this sound to that Jewish crowd? What do you mean you're going to die? You're the Messiah. You're supposed to live forever. You're supposed to reign forever. And reigning forever after you die is kind of problematic in my experience. They were confused. Because again, they were listening with their own ears instead of listening with the ears of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have ears to hear. The crowd is even more confused. What in the world is going on? And in and the end of all of this that Jesus has is, is said, they, they ask a question, and it's really a profound question, and it's really a question all of us need to wrestle with at some point in time. They ask, who is this Son of Man? Who is this guy, Jesus? Now, I don't know about you, but just in this one conversation, just in this one story, Jesus has proved who he is. He has spoken and God answered I, we shouldn't need any more evidence than that. But not all the crowd believed. Even the disciples were unsure of what he was saying, but it says they felt back on this later, and it kind of answered a lot of questions for him, right? After the resurrection. When they're the same place we are on this side of the resurrection, they took what he said and said, okay, now it makes sense. And a lot of that happens to me, happened to me when I got saved. When I got saved, reading the Bible made a lot more sense because the Holy Spirit was there speaking to me and helping me understand things better. Okay, and, and that's the same for each and every one of us. Jesus, how does he respond to this? Well, he goes into one of, one of his and probably one of John's favorite metaphors for Jesus Christ, right? He is the light, the light of the world. Jesus is the light. His identity couldn't possibly have been clearer in view of his words and his works. And people all had an opportunity to believe in him. The word of God says, while you still have the light, believe in the light so you may become sons of the light. What is it about light? I mean, I, I like it to be good and dark if I'm sleeping. But if I'm trying to get something accomplished, I need some light. Maybe I don't see as well in the dark as other people, but if I'm walking around in a room, even if it's my own room that I, I live in and I know like in the back of my hand, I still want a little bit of light going on. Because I know darkness is a place where bad things can happen. That's true physically if you don't, if you don't like stubbed toes, if you don't like to kick furniture, but it's also true spiritually. Because we tend to do evil deeds where? In the darkness. Why? Because we don't want anybody else to know about them. It's one of the things that I see in the world we live in today that's honestly a little alarming. Uh, I had a little Facebook conversation with a good friend of mine, and you know, Facebook arguments typically is a very bad idea. But he was saying, what is this, y'all talking about this golden age where everything was better? 
Things have never been better. We've always been sinful people. And my response to him was, yeah, but now we used to hide our sin. Now we throw a parade for it. And I think that's bad. So in some ways, this illustration isn't as powerful in 2021 as it was even 10 years ago. But the reality is light is good. Darkness is bad. That's a metaphor throughout all of literature and throughout all of human experience. And Jesus says, I am the light. And honestly, he's saying the same thing to us here today. We need to believe in the light so that we may become sons and daughters of the light. I mean, you might say, but Nash, is he really here? I mean, good grief, we're worshiping online only. There's a disease or a, a virus out there that's scaring a lot of folks a lot, and, and we just can't do the same things that we used to be able to do. How in the world can you say God is here and that Jesus is in our presence? Well, it's because of Matthew 18, 20, right? For wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. You might be saying to yourself, Nash, I'm watching this and I'm the only one in the room. Well, guess what? First of all, if you're a child of God, God's there with you too because he lives right here. But even if you aren't a child of God, even if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your heart, God is present because his word is being proclaimed. We here are gathered. There are more than two people here in this sanctuary. We are gathered for one purpose and one alone, and that's to glorify God. And that means he is here. And I don't think we can really split any technological hairs effectively because the reality is wherever you are watching this, he's there too. He is with us everywhere we go and he is there everywhere he is worshiped and his word is proclaimed. His word transforms us. It's my prayer that his word will transform each of us today and make us more like Christ, more like children of the light. You know, we started today talking about purpose, right? We've been talking about purpose a lot today, and our purpose, again, this, is, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. We said it from the beginning. What's our purpose? To glorify God in everything that we do. Now, the details of our individual purpose for our time here on earth will be different. But again, that overarching purpose has got to be to glorify God. So if you ever have to ask yourself, you're trying to make a decision, should I do A or should I do B? And you ask yourself, well, A glorifies God, B, I'm not so sure, your decision's made. Because if what you're doing doesn't glorify God, stop. And that goes for me, that goes for all of us. Our overarching purpose in life is to glorify God. My, my challenge for each of us today is to simply glorify God in everything that we do. Now, admittedly, that's going to look different for everyone. Because again, our individual callings, the individual path God has called us on is different for every person. But my prayer is that God will give us ears to hear from him so that we can follow him. We can follow his lead in everything that we do. In closing, I really just want each and every one of us to remember the words of Paul in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. It's a powerful passage to me. It's one of my favorite passages because it speaks of how God glorified Jesus and why, what Jesus did, what was his act of obedience that God glorified him higher than any other name. And us as Christians, literally the word Christian means little Christ. So that tells us we should seek the same attitude about life and the same purpose in life that he does. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, ex who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus 
Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. It's my prayer each and every one of us will travel the path that God has laid out for each and every one of us and follow Him in everything that we do so that we can glorify Him. That's what life's all about, folks. If you want to ever ask the question, why am I here? I, I mean, here in this sanctuary, there, wherever you sit watching this, or why am I here on earth? The answer to that is very simple. We're here to glorify God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you for the opportunity to glorify you. The opportunity to share our lives with those around us, not, not for our glory, Lord, but for yours. Help us, Lord, to take advantage of all of those opportunities that you give us, all of the relationships that we have. Many times difficulties in life are, are great times to share where our true hope comes from because this world and hope don't always get along real well. But in you, Lord, we have hope. There truly is nothing better than following where you lead. Help us, Lord, to glorify you in everything that we do. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. Now we're getting ready to have our hymn of invitation. Go ahead. And, and it's gonna be a little different this time, right? The altar is, of course, open for prayer at any time, but you aren't here. So what does that mean you're gonna do? Well, here's my prayer, is that you'll turn wherever you are right now into an altar for God. Kneel physically or in your heart before the Lord God and ask yourself this question. Where would you have me to go, Lord? And it's my hope and prayer that as Ronnie leads us singing this song, we'll all be telling the absolute truth and we say wherever God leads us, that's exactly where we'll go. Ronnie.